Hi there, and welcome to the show. I'm your host, John Iveson, and this week I'm joined by Alistair McGregor, who is the NDP MP for Cowichan Malahat Langford in British Columbia, and he's the vice chair of the special joint committee that just tabled an important report on the medical assistance in dying issue. Welcome, Alistair. Thank you very much, John. You've been on various committees looking at this subject for three years or more, and you've probably heard more testimony than just about anybody else in the House. So thanks for coming on to, to lend your perspective. Um, I just want to recap for people who have not followed uh, every blow of this story. 2016, the Liberal government came up with the legislation on medical assistance in dying in response to the Supreme Court ruling in the Carter case that said prohibition of MAID violated the Charter. Uh, MAID, medical assistance in dying, was introduced for people whose death was reasonably foreseeable but expanded to those who were not suffering at the end of life in 2021 after a Quebec Superior Court challenge. The government responded with new legislation that broadened the access but explicitly excluded mental illness on the basis that screening for mental illness was uh, prone to a high degree of error. However, a Senate amendment expanded access to those with mental disorders, a decision that was then punted down the road um, by introducing a sunset clause that came into effect last March. That date was further extended to this March 17th in order to allow your committee to uh, judge whether Canada is prepared for the safe application for MAID where the sole underlying condition is mental illness. That committee has responded this week in the negative and the government has agreed. So where does that leave us? Is that a, a pause or do you think it's a repudiation of the idea that MAID should be extended to those where the sole underlying condition is mental illness? Well, it, I think at this moment it is definitely a pause, but uh, the problem is really is of the government's own making. Um, you know, I did vote in favor of the original version of C7, but uh, our caucus did reject the Senate amendment uh, that was made at the 11th hour and completely contrary to the government's original charter statement on that particular provision. And I think all of the consequences you're seeing, um, you know, the continuous extension punting down the road, they're all a result of that decision of accepting a Senate amendment by the government. And it feels, you know, my, my big concern when the government accepted that Senate amendment and then established the special joint committee, it felt as a committee member, because I have been on the committee from the beginning, it felt like we were playing a game of catch up. You know, the law had been changed, but we hadn't done the consultation uh, the um, you know consulting with with uh, experts and researchers in the field, and even with the general Canadian public, so it feels like we've kind of been building the plane as it's been flying midair. Um, from my perspective, and you'll see that evidenced in the witness testimony, there is quite a wide spectrum of opinion from both professionals in law and professionals in medical practice. But I think what is quite striking is that uh, amongst psychiatrists and psychologists and, and indeed the wider medical community, community, there is quite a wide amount of professional discomfort with this expansion. And yeah. um, I don't know if we are going to ever be ready, but we certainly are not ready now. That is my opinion, and I think that's backed up by many of our expert witnesses. So, so let's come back on to some of the, the witness uh, testimony. Um, in due course, but just before the committee reported, there was a Dalhousie academic, Dalhousie University academic, Jocelyn, Jocelyn Downey, who said, the courts have spoken and essentially said Parliament has no option but to grant those with a medical disorder access to MAID this March. Do you, do you think the courts have spoken? I mean, the Supreme Court hasn't spoken on it. And does Parliament have agency here? No, the, the courts have not spoken on this particular matter, on mental disorder as a sole underlying medical condition. In fact, you can see uh, many people in the aftermath of our committee report and the government's decision to introduce legislation, many people are now saying that we, in fact, will have to go to the courts to settle this. But look, uh, to, to that uh, you know, broader question, um, when I've been at the committee, I've struggled between uh, two concepts at play. Uh, number one, uh, the right of an individual to make a decision over his or her own body, uh, a charter protected right, Section 7. I've also been guided by Section 15, equality under the law. Um, 
And I very firmly believe in the Charter, but I also believe, uh, and, and this is the other concept that's been guiding my work at committee, that society also has a duty at times to step in and protect the most vulnerable in our society. And it's quite evident in Canada that there are many marginalized communities, be they in remote or rural communities, or even in our urban centers, who quite simply are not getting the mental health care that they need. And there's a huge deficit in our country. So to the larger constitutional question that's underlying some of that witness testimony, um, a lot of people seem to forget that we also have a very important section one in our charter, uh, which does say that rights are not absolute. And sometimes it may be in society's interest to, to limit them or give pause to them. So. This may ultimately have to go to the courts, but it has not been settled by the courts to this date. And I would agree that Parliament does have some agency. I think the elected members on the Special Joint Committee, uh, we played an important role, but it seemed to always have been a catch-up role to a law that had already been changed before we had done our work. Let's look at the report that came down from the Special uh, Joint Committee this week. We had from 21 witnesses, legal and medical, concluded that the system is not ready. Um, how much of that was based on logistics, that we just simply don't have enough assessors or providers in place? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the committee's report was further bolstered by the fact that a letter was released uh, this week it was signed by seven out of 10 provinces and all three territories. So these are the ministers of health and in some case, the ministers of mental health and addictions for, for seven out of 10 provinces. Uh, and given that you know, the primary oversight um, for readiness, because you know, our job as federal politicians is to look at the carve out in the criminal code, but the vast majority of the oversight, transparency and accountability of the system as a whole is done by the provincial governments. Now, if you have seven out of 10 provincial governments in all three territories stating in an open letter that the system is not ready and that they want an indefinite pause on the expansion, I think we have to give a lot of credibility uh, to, to those statements from those ministers. Um, so, you know, in terms of uh, the, the state of, of readiness as a whole, uh, I. I put a lot of stock in the fact that there was a widespread amount of professional discomfort. This is coming directly from psychiatrists and psychologists who work in the field. Well, let's talk to that. I mean, the, the government instituted model practice standards, presumably standards by which uh, people who were looking to access it and made were assessed. Um, there were some pretty fundamental disagreements over the standards. One, one witness speaking on behalf of uh, eight chairs of psychiatry said that the model practice standard does not require a psychiatrist to be involved in the assessment of requests. I mean, if a, if a psychiatrist is not involved in that assessment, who is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, great question. And uh, uh, when we, some of the psychiatrists who were our witnesses also uh, stated that it is uh, quite impossible to differentiate between uh, suicidality and you know a, a psychotic episode where where a, a mental disorder is is actually separate and apart from suicidal thoughts so uh you know they they just said with our current practice standards it's simply impossible to make that determination and furthermore if you look at the specific language in the criminal code for the track two cases because you know your listeners have to rec remember that in the criminal code with the changes in c7 we have track one, where a natural death is, is reasonably foreseeable. So this is a, usually a terminal illness like cancer. Um, but track two is where the death is not uh, reasonably or naturally foreseeable. And in that case, there are certain safeguards that are put in place in the criminal code. But some of the witnesses did report to our committee, and in briefs they submitted to committee members, that you know it is possible for the interpretation of that track two to be quite broad and it leave, gives a lot of leeway to the assessor, which as you mentioned, John, uh, does not have to be a psychiatrist. So I, I think, uh, you know, to me personally, that that's a bit troubling. These are people who have developed a specialty 
uh, and many of the witnesses uh, measured their experience in the decades uh, of serving their patients. So the, the things that set alarm bells ringing for me were the, the committee statement that it heard, it is difficult, if not impossible, to accurately predict the long-term prognosis of a person with a mental disorder. And secondly, the witness, uh, Dr. Sonu Gained from uh, Sunnybrook, uh, his statement that clinicians' predictions are wrong one half of the time. Mm -hmm. That would seem to make it very hard to proceed with MAID at any point for people with yes. mental illness. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and you, I mean, we're talking about a mental disorder as the sole underlying medical condition. So uh, it could be separate apart from anything else. Uh, if, if you're just, if you've been suffering from a mental disorder and uh, you, you have those kind of statistics in play, then yes, absolutely, I think that should be quite concerning. I think the other thing I'd like to add too is, you know, if you look at our committee's work on, on this specific question, we did not have a lot of time. I really wish we had had far more runway to uh, delve into this very, very sensitive subject. We really only had three three hour meetings with witnesses, and uh, I, we just we were limited by the fact that the law is going to change on March seventeenth. So I would have preferred our committee to have been struck far earlier and for us to have had a, a lot more chances to uh, interview a a wider spectrum of witnesses and even uh, provincial health officials as well. I guess advocates say that in practice a person would need to have a really long history of failed treatment attempts in order to be found eligible. In effect this would mean it would be a very small number of people that would be affected and therefore it does not justify all the fear mongering. Is that valid or I mean, we're, or are we talking about people's lives and therefore um, it doesn't matter if it's one or a hundred? <laughs> Well, yeah, and I think that uh, point that you raise also has to be put in the context of what I said earlier, and that's the fact that so many uh, people across Canada from coast to coast to coast, um, you know, they are living in marginalized populations and they simply have not had access to adequate treatment or care. Um, I, I don't know if, uh, you know, that always holds up because as I mentioned, you know, the interpretation of the criminal code, uh, I think, is broad enough to, to allow for some instances where you, you could uh, bypass that. And again, the fact that there is no requirement for a psychiatrist to, to be involved. So, um, yeah, I, I just see uh, too many pitfalls with where we're currently at, uh, hence, hence the need uh, certainly for a pause. And I don't yet know how long that's going to be. Um, I, I hope the government will, they, I mean, they really do have to have the legislation ready quite soon to see uh, what kind of a time frame they're looking at. How would you like to see it proceed? I mean, do you think that, um, I mean, ultimately, it, it is a law, and if you want to uh, change it rather than pause it, you need to come up with a new law, which presumably would mm -hmm. mean more, more committee meetings. Is that how you see things proceeding? Yeah, I, I absolutely think the committee does need to be struck again. I, that's why we included that in our recommendation. And, uh, you know, you'll, you'll also note that it, our recommendation did not include a timeline. We, we, we put in specific qualitative markers, you know, that the, the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Health, their respective uh, departments, but also their provincial counterparts, uh, need to be satisfied. So there's not a timeline, and I think that's bolstered by the fact that the provincial health ministers and ministers of mental health and addictions also said an indefinite pause. So I, we've gotten ourselves into trouble by putting in these kinds of time frames. Um, Bill C-39 was passed last year to give a one-year extension. That obviously wasn't enough because we're now entertaining the exact same thing. So. Uh, before the law is changed, I would like to see the committee struck again. I would like to see a much wider runway and broader set of witnesses to come forward. I think um, from the House's perspective, the House of Commons, we will probably be able to get the legislation passed through our chamber in pretty short order. The Senate, though, may be a, another beast entirely, and it'll be interesting to see how the Red Chamber reacts. I've got to go back to that decision. I mean, it was an 11th hour amendment, as you, as you mentioned, from the Senate. I mean, mm -hmm. the, anybody who spent five minutes looking at it, which obviously you did and you rejected it, how could the government not have foreseen that this was a world of hurt coming down towards them? 
I really don't know. Uh, we, you know, we, we had the votes. Everything seemed fine at the third reading stage of the House when C7 was sent to the Senate. There was a charter statement, which, which I thought was reasonably written and uh, cogently argued. Uh, and then, to everyone's surprise, the government did a complete 180, accepted a, a very, very consequential Senate amendment at the, at the last minute, brought it back to the House. And uh, I, I think a lot of us on the opposition side, I can't speak for the other parties, but as New Democrats, uh, we were really caught by surprise. And I remember having conversations with our justice critic, Randall Garrison, and uh, he, he was just flabbergasted at the government's decision. And every problem you see now with this issue can be directly tied back to that consequential decision. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, Alistair, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for the work you've been doing on the committee. See you next time. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much for your interest. Mm -hmm.